So for all of you who said, uh, to get this updated on my machine, let me go to So for all of you guys who said, uh, my name doesn't appear on your schedule, uh, I was really puzzled. Is anybody here? Yeah, you were, you were one of them. I was really puzzled because I knew I put you on there. I had the print area on this Excel sheet. <laughs> it wasn't the whole sheet. So I was missing the names at the bottom. But so... You're a rash, right? You're a rash. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're here. That's not your project. No. What was your project? Hmm? The, uh, the graph visualization project. Oh, that's must be a that's a typo on my part then, because. Huh. Well, I'll fix that. Send you know it'll still the date will be the same, but I'll I'll send the email to me again. I'm sorry, it's probably the third email you've sent me, but. No, no, I'll send you after. Yeah. Okay. You you you'll have to send me an email so I remember to get it on this presentation schedule, the right name. And so, uh, and uh, when you send it, you need to send it to the Time Warner email, not my, not ECS, not JW Fawcett at ECS at, at SYR.edu. It's a Time Warner. Yeah. Okay. And so there's somebody else who was saying I didn't, so uh, Zemo isn't here. So, but anyway, everybody should be here now. Everybody in the class should see their name, and if I haven't gotten the right project title, then let me know. See me after class and I'll fix it. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, I, I don't think we quite finished up the COM roadmap. Let's uh, look at it again and see if we did. Maybe I did. So we talked about that. We talked about that. We talked about, uh, yeah, we didn't quite. So, <clears throat> so basically, uh, I said these words, the, the uh, dynamic link libraries are, we're sharing code in both memory and on the disk, and big systems like Windows that use, you know, some components in almost all applications, like directory services used in almost all applications, instead of replicating that code in every one of 400 uh, processes that may run on the machine, uh, and 23 of them are running right now, there's only one copy of the code in a shared DLL, shared library. And uh, so we say both this space and uh, uh, random access. Uh, another thing, another reason why we use COM is to break these uh, uh, compile and link time dependencies by using an interface and an object factory and building the DLL building the, the uh, component as a DLL, 
And so, uh, you know, when you do a Windows update, Microsoft isn't sending a technician to your home to recompile Windows. It's downloading COM components. It's doing it. So when it's updated, just blah, 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 down, come, come. Next time you start up one, and if it tells you to reboot, it's because it wants you to pick them up right away, not wait for the next time that you start up Windows, but if it's a security patch, for example. <clears throat> um, there are a bunch of technologies beside com corba was uh, is used i think still some by the uh, banking system and some by uh, some of the armed services department of defense contracts still use corba some uh, which is a something like com it's a distributed technology uses uh, the network data representation uh, we'll see in a little bit today that COM uses an interface definition language to uh, define the data types that are being used, and Corbin does the same thing. Uh, Java Beans is a little different, but, but you now they're trying to accomplish more or less the same thing. So part one of the solution is code reuse by using DLLs, uh, and there's a bunch of references here, and you know here's the summary of that model. So we have uh, a bunch of applications running in memory. And if we don't, if we use static libraries or, uh, you know, then uh, that, that uh, code it exists in memory and it also exists on the disk. But if we use a, a dynamic link library, then uh, we have this situation in memory uh, these guys simply have the stack frames. They have the, they don't have the code, but they have the local stack. You know, when I call a function, that function uh, allocates stack memory for input parameters, local data, and return types. And every function is called, if, you, if a function calls a function calls a function, you have a, a, frame, a, a stack of those frames. Okay. And uh, all of that uh, exists in each one of these because they, they probably need different values of, of those uh, data items. But all the code is shared on both, the, on both in random access memory and on the disk. So solution one, dynamic link libraries. Standard interfaces. So, uh, you know, standard interfaces, uh, uh, help us break the uh, uh, compile time dependency, and COM defines a whole bunch of uh, COM publishes interfaces. We're going to see that in a little bit. Um, up to now, you've probably used in some of my projects in OD or, or SMA, you've used uh, an interface or two, but they're private to the application. They're public, but, but only known in that application. But COM uh, publishes the interfaces uh, machine-wide, and in fact, uh, if you're using Microsoft interfaces Windows-wide, everywhere, okay, the published known interfaces is an interface called iUnknown, which we'll talk about uh, a little later on. So we're trying to, uh, you know, break compile time and link time dependencies. We break compile time dependencies by using standard interfaces and object factories, and we break link time dependencies by building as DLLs. Uh, and uh, another uh, solution that COM provides is management of object lifetime. So remember that we have a library loaded into into memory that's supporting a bunch of several applications that are running at one time. Now, if you look across Windows, all the stuff that's running, there's probably, I would guess, there's probably 40 or 50 of those libraries at any one time in memory, serving stuff. And, but 
if you don't do lifetime management and you keep Windows running, you don't reboot it, you know, you keep it running for a month, which is what I do. You know, it'll, it'll re it reboots when I get an update, but that's the only time it reboots. Uh, you'll have th that those libraries, if you don't do li uh, lifetime management, those libraries are in memory, even though that you're not using them, and pretty soon your memory fills up and your machine gets slower and you page fault, page fault, page fault. So it has to be some kind of management. For these big systems like Windows, they're doing you know pervasive code sharing everywhere. Then you got to manage lifetime. And the way we do that, the way Com does it, is with application cooperation of the application. Uh, the application, the uh, component can't know when the application is done with it. So. What COM does is it asks the application to release the interface when it's done. And then it keeps track of the, uh, uh, those releases with a reference count. There's actually two reference counts that are being used. One is a reference count for the uh, instances inside a component, and another reference count is for the library itself. And when both the, the instance count goes to zero and the library user count goes to zero, then it removes the library from that. So it's kind of an automatic uh, mechanism for doing that. Uh, uh, the things we've worked on, uh, uh, WCF, for example, uses a different policy. It has this uh, per call activation, a Client activated, which is a least lifetime, and singleton activation, least lifetime. It's same thing, solving the same problem, but in a somewhat different way. So, comms mechanism is to provide uh, reference counted management of the lifetime. Uh, registration. So, the problem here is that. Um, if you want to use a component-intensive uh, construction process, I want to build stuff as much as I can. I want to build stuff out of pre-existing components. I'm going to have a lot of components. And it's unrealistic to expect that any one application can keep track of all that. You know? So what COM does is uh, it uses the registry so a component has to be registered, and what that means is there's a uh, universal ID, it's called a GUID, um, um, what's the G stand? I'm trying to remember, Global, globally unique, thank you, globally unique ID is what GUID stands for, globally unique ID. And, uh, oh, I said it right here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the the user application has to know the GUID, but uh, provided they know a GUID by looking it up or something someplace, uh, uh, the GUID is a key in the registry, and the registry holds the path where that object is, and the, the uh, path can change. Who cares? Because all I need is a GUID. I get to the registry, and the registry tells me where it currently is now. So. Uh, that location transparency is part of the is a problem, and uh, uh, comms mechanism is a so one solution to that problem using the registry. Uh, Interprocess communication is another. So, uh, Com started out life as OLE. Object linking and embedding, and it, it it was created so that uh, an Office Excel chart could be put in a Word document. Compound documents, and what really happens is, uh, you know, you can edit an Excel chart in your Word document. Uh, Word doesn't know anything about Excel. So how does that happen? It happens because when you embed a cell chart in Word, Word starts up a hidden Excel application it's running, but it doesn't display a window. And when you do editing things, 
uh, on that Excel chart in your Word document, it's making calls, inter-process communication calls to Excel. So Tom grew up with this model of inter-process communication. They're called out-of-proc components. We're not going to build any this semester, but we'll look quickly at, uh, you know, we'll take as much time as we have. I used to, before we did, when the classes were smaller, we weren't doing so many presentations, we went through the out-of-proc components. Completely. I'm not going to do that now. We, we don't have time, but uh, we'll talk quickly about it. And um, so, uh, Calm from its ground up knows how to uh, knows how to do that. Now, one of the things that's happening is Calm is uh, segregating. It wants you to be able to run a client and a component uh, interoperate between a client. It wants a client to be able to use a component, even though the security models or the threading models. Are different and it does that uh, with a uh, with a device called an apartment an apartment is a boundary if if a client and component have different threading models or different security models they have to be in different apartments and if they're in different threading apartments uh, there's going to be a proxy stuff relationship just like there is you know just like you do in interprocess communication even it might even if it's in the same process, there is that still you're communicating, you're sending messages, you're taking a stack print, turning it down on messages, sending it over the wire, building it back up in the stack print, applying it to that remote, remote object, even if it's in the same, it's in a different apartment. It's remote to this apartment, it's in this other apartment. So calm from the ground up was built to do that kind of kind of stuff. And we will do that, you have to be aware that that's what's happening. Otherwise, things will surprise you. So, in a process communication. Automation is another part of that uh, recipe. I started talking about that last time. Um, uh, the original intent was that Visual Basic uh, be a client that makes Calm easy to use. Building, see, we will discover that building C++ clients for Calm is a little not tricky but intricate. You got there's a bunch of things you have to do, and uh, lots of developers in Microsoft complained about that back in the old days. And so uh, they took this Visual Basic scripting language, which was really mostly used for uh, writing macro scripts in in Excel and Word, things like that, and uh, promoted it to become a client. For COM objects, you build the client with Visual Basic, uh, and but that was at the time Visual Basic was a scripting language, and so it can't compile in the definition of an interface. So it's got it gets built into it one single interface, this universal interface, an automation interface, and that interface has a single function called invoke, and in invoke you pass it a a uh, number that says that's the function I want you to call. And you pass it in a structure that says here's the parameters I want you to apply to that function. And you pull out from it a structure that says here's the research results. Okay. All from that universal interface. And Visual Basic does that. And it turns out C Sharp does it. Even though C Sharp is compiled, C Sharp starts to come that way. And Python, Iron Ruby, you know, all those things. They have that automation interface built into them, and they can talk to come up. So finally, we wind up with uh, local and remote plug compatible components. So that's the whole idea. <clears throat> So uh, let's do a little bit of comparison here. Uh, I'm going to do some back and forth comparisons. A couple of them I'm going to kind of skip over because we've done it in earlier classes. So uh, this is a comparison of COM versus .NET. So 
Remember that com started out being the next version of a, a .NET started out being the next version of com. There was the com I'm going to talk about, and then com plus plus was uh, developed. And what the com plus plus or com plus I forgot, but what it did did was it introduced. A uh, distributed transaction manager. The really the only difference between COM plus and COM was COM plus provided this distributed transaction manager and a few little tools to make that work properly for enterprise applications. Doing distributed transaction management is a little tricky. Remember that you for the transaction is a is a uh, commit or rollback. If an error happens, so you got several things packaged in this transaction, and in order for the state to change, every one of them has to succeed. So one is remove that money from my savings account, and the other is put that money into my checking account. If remove the money from the savings account fail, and that put that money in my checking account succeeded, the bank would be very unhappy. If the remove the money from my uh, savings account succeeded, and the put that money in my checking account failed, you'd be very unhappy. Okay, and distributed transactions is all about never letting that happen. So you might do an operation successfully, the next one failed, and then the whole thing has to roll back. And what it means is, I'm doing a bunch of computation off the side on temporary stuff, and then if everything succeeds, then I make it permanent, which is normally a pointer swap. Yeah. So uh, it's you know it's I, it's more complicated than that in a lot of cases, but that's what this so COM++ plus plus was all about. Providing this uh, distributed transaction management. So, you know, I got a database here, and I got databases over here. So here I am, you know, uh, key bank, and I'm getting a, 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 a money funds transfer from Chase. So two different databases, two different uh, machines, two different states, maybe. Now, uh, then .NET came along, and .NET was supposed to be the successor to COM+. Plus. But uh, they, make, they made a lot of changes, a lot of interesting ideas. Finally, they said, uh, -uh this isn't COM+. Plus. This isn't the next version of COM. This is a new thing, .NET. Uh, but you'll see, as we talk about COM, you'll say, that sounds like .NET. Gee, that sounds like .NET. Gee, that. And what's happening is .NET just incorporated a lot of those COM ideas in better ways, in more modern, easier to understand, easier to use ways, but that's what, it's, that's what happened. So uh, COM strengths, it's everywhere on Windows, Windows Operating System, GUI Controls, Excel, Visio, .NET CLR. It's accessible from clients built with Different languages, C, C++, C Sharp, VB, JavaScript, and different compilers on those languages. That, that all that interoperation works. Clients and components don't need to support the same threading models or the same security models. All of that works. Uh, but the reason that all this works is COM is complicated. Partly COM is complicated because it was over ambitious. It was trying to do, in my opinion, too much. But partly, it's complicated because it was built in 1990, around is when it started to flower, maybe a little earlier than that. And we just didn't know how to do stuff that well then. You know, OO was just really starting up. And there was a lot of stuff we didn't really know how to do too well. OO let us hide a lot of the plumbing. And the guys who developed COM weren't totally into that, hide the plumbing carefully, okay? And so COM leaves a lot of plumbing hanging out. That's why it's complicated. It's hard to, you know, you got to know a lot about the design of COM in order to use it. Yeah. So uh, 
How does the calm resolve the worsening of DLL problem? Right. Uh, it doesn't. Here. That's one of calm's outstanding problems. Uh, it doesn't as well. It does, but it doesn't do it nearly as well as .NET. .NET uses a strong naming convention, the Gaussian, you can store side by side stuff. Uh, Tom has had that from day one. It had a what they call DLL hell. I got the wrong DLL version for this client. Okay, and it never really solved that. And one reason why .NET became was created was to, you know, everybody knew that was a problem. That was one of the problems they were trying to solve. Uh, are we adding to the same question? Uh, if it's in .NET, so we can have a DLL of different versions and the application of different versions you compiled with different compilers, actually. Yep. So we can still use different them. compilers. The versions will compilers. do with different comp compilers. But .NET, you know, yeah. across from, from C sharp to C sharp, you know, uh, Mono has a C-sharp compiler and, and, and Microsoft has a C-sharp compiler and they may be able to interoperate completely but I don't think there's a completely binary standard for C-sharp either. I'm sorry, so I, I was uh, meant about like, different yeah. versions of the compiler. Well, so what happens is that components are, if you, know, if you want to manage that name, you, you use a strong, uh, a strong name which means that there's a certificate key behind it, okay, that identifies it. And when you do a build, build fails if you're building a, a, against the wrong version. That didn't happen in COM. The build would succeed, but it wouldn't work right because you had the wrong version. In .NET, the build fails because you have the wrong version. And now, then you're given the option. You can tell the compiler, I'm willing to let you use uh, from this version forward, okay, for my build, and you know, there's ways of managing it. But and what we do, and what we do, we typically don't strongly name our parts. You know, in a SNA, for example, we didn't. I probably told you how to do it. If I didn't, I'll show you here in this class. But uh, uh, you know, so. There's a there's a key associated with that version number, and the builds just fail if the unless you give it the instruction. But for that to work, it has to be stored in the global assembly cache, the dash, and you can't store it in the global assembly cache unless it's strongly named. Uh, so COM is complicated. COM is a very weak object model, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, it's an aging technology, still heavily used by Microsoft. And we're even in WinRT, that's building the Windows app and you know the mo supposedly modern components. There are really wrappers around COM. And .NET, you've seen this. You know, you know what the .NET strengths and weaknesses are. So let me skip over that. Uh, let's uh, compare the C++. You've seen this too, the C++ object model and .NET object model. Uh, if you took SMA or OOD, you've seen this slide. Let me, let me jump over it. So this is the C++ object model and the COM object model. So all in C++, all objects share this rich memory model, rich lifetime model, semantics based on a deep copy model, blah, blah, blah. For COM, Weak object model based on C++, but no inheritance of implementation, which is a major limitation. No deep copies, no deep assignment, no construction with parameters, only default construction. Com function except a very limited set of argument types. That's com. Can you do, can I do everything I need to do? The answer is absolutely yes. Microsoft guys have been doing it with com. Um, uh, you know, for scores of years. Uh, and there are, you know, there are deeper, you know, there's ways to handle a lot of a lot of those issues, not all of them. But uh, this no inheritance of implementation, this is almost a showstopper. Because what that means is that if I want to use some existing COM technology, 
I can't take your com object and inherit from it and share your code. I get to rewrite all that code. I got I get to figure out how to write all that code. Now the ATL Active Template Library basically fixed that problem because they have a whole series of classes that have captured the primary important um, objects that, that Microsoft has developed. And so you just, uh, uh, that's inside the com boundary, there's a com wrap wrap, but inside that com boundary, you get you could get to inherit from classes from Microsoft Classes, stuff like that. So, and we'll see some of that in action uh, in, a, in a week and a half, I think, something like that. Com strength, strong support for updating systems uh, composed of com components. Uh, you know, this is this is why Microsoft is the powerhouse it is. Supports a limited form of garbage collection based on reference counting uh, and so on. Language comparison. Uh, let me skip over C, C++ and C Sharp. Let's compare C++ and com. So C++ uses header files to declare class services. Com um, doesn't. Com um, uses interface definition language as an IDL file. So when you build a com component, you define the IDL and you write a CPP. The IDL takes the place of the header file. And there is a compiler called MIDL, Microsoft IDL compiler, that takes your Interface definition language and compiles it into it creates C plus plus headers that you are actually including. You don't know that you are. You don't see that you are. That's kind of hidden from you, but that's what's happening unless you dig a little bit. Uh, so the IDL generates component dot h. If you're if I name my component C M P N T, okay. This is where the interface declarations are. We're writing IDL. We're not writing those class declarations. We're writing IDL. And that IDL gets converted into interface declarations. Component underscore I dot C defines GUIDs. This supplies the GUID values, the global unique identifiers. Uh, uh, component underscore P dot C defines proxies. Remember I said that if we're, if we're uh, interoperating with something in a different apartment, we have different threading model or different security model, we have to use a Communication channel. That's generated here. You don't have to write that. You didn't write the proxy. You didn't write the stub. But uh, but uh, this was well. Maybe in the old days you wrote it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, program parts must be compiled using the same compiler to ensure interoperability. Uh, they have to share, the client components must share the same threading and security models. So they must share the same compiler, the same security, the same threading model. In COM, interoperability across multiple languages and any compiler that, that provides support for COM, uh, all of these components and clients may use different threading and security models. So some really powerful, useful stuff it's just packaged in an old archaic clumsy, let all the plumbing hang out. You got to worry about the plumbing. You got to understand the plumbing to make this work. Okay. But ATL, the ATL libraries has sort of pasted over that. It's, it's used, if you took the, the, uh, the uh, design patterns, it's a big ball of mud. It's that nice, it's sweeping it under the rug, hiding it under this. Same interface that you can use. Okay. Like facade, it's a facade, but the big ball of mud was saying there's all that plum, you know, crummy plumbing stuff hanging out, all that badly written, you know, code. And but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hide that. It really is a facade, but we're gonna hide that behind a well-designed interface. And so that's you know kind of what kind of what happens here. Okay, so uh, let's start looking at a little bit at the, some of the details. So,
do I have a PowerPoint question? Okay, so what can you do with COM? What is COM? What is DCOM? Blah, blah, blah. So, uh, one form, the MPROC form, which is what we're going to use for project one, uh, inside a Windows process, we have a uh, client, uh, EXE, that talks to different components using an interface. So, this, here's the client exe, and it's loaded these DLLs. And that loading is an explicit loading. Remember we, in our, the demo we did a little earlier, we had implicit loading and explicit. This is an uh, explicit loading of those DLLs. And uh, they all have guaranteed to have uh, uh, an interface, so it has a custom interface that the client, that's what he wants to talk to, but it has an interface called iUnknown that uh, supports querying for other interfaces, supports add, ref, and release. iUnknown has three functions in it, query interface, add, ref, and release. And normally, uh, system code calls add, ref, and client call, call calls release because only the client knows when he's done with it. And um, uh, in order for com, so com is going to create those components. We're going to say to com, co-create instance. That's a that's a com runtime function, and we give it a GUID and say that's what I want you to create. And so it goes to the registry. Finds where that DLL is, loads the DLL in memory, you know, looks at looks at the models, the apartment models. Those are embedded in the registry, and if necessary, it wraps this could be communication channel between the puts a communication channel between the client and the DLL. So, uh, so we just load them, and uh, the model is that we can reuse lots and lots of existing stuff. Um, tends to be fairly fine-grained stuff. Another way we could use it is, remember the OLE, object linking embedding thing. Here we have two different processes. We have a client in one process. We have a server in another process that has an internal component. And this happens in two forms. So if you look down task manager, service host, 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 on and on and on and on. Those service hosts are executable executables that load a DLL for you to interact with. Yeah. Now, you know, so this, this process I mean yeah, client.exe. So no. So those guys, let me hit the right one here so I save this. So, uh, service host loads the DLL. Uh, that's one flavor. The other flavor is that this isn't just a host to support a COM component. It's a whole executable like Excel. 
which by the way, loads a whole bunch of COM components, because Excel is built out of COM. But so uh, sometimes you talk to, you're talking from one process to another process to a, a host that doesn't do anything except support that DLL and expose its interface, so you can call it. But the other flavor is, no, I'm Excel, I do my own thing, and oh, by the way, yes, I have these DLLs, but, but, but. So. Uh, another thing that COM does is build ActiveX controls uh, these aren't used as much anymore. This is kind of going away. Uh, WinForms use all these. Every control in WinForms is an ActiveX control. In WPF, most of the controls are drawn, but some of them aren't. All the dialogues you use aren't. They're all ActiveX controls. Eventually, WPF will probably throw them away and, you know, do their own. But, so, uh, so what happens with an ActiveX control is there's a container. This might be Word or, you know, some framework. It might be just a frame window. And this control might be a list box in that window. And there are probably 50 or 40 or 50 interfaces between these two guys to support all kinds of stuff. One of the things that this does is a, uh, a technology called in-place activation. And what's going on is, in something like a wind form, everything you see is a window. A button is a window. A list box is a window. An element in the list box is a window. Uh, uh, a checkbox is a window. They're all windows. And so you're probably looking at 30 or 40 windows. Those are all, in wind forms, uh, ActiveX objects. And if when we started up, we created them all and activated them all, you know, got all their internal objects created and instances created. That'll be two minutes before we could do anything with a wind form. So they don't. What they do is uh, an ActiveX control is responsible for defining a bitmap that looks, it's a portrait, but it's just a bitmap. Not the real object, but that gets pasted onto the container. So up comes the wind form, there's a, there's a list box. It's just a bitmap. Uh, when you click on it, in-place activation now calls co-create instance to create that list box crawl and puts it where it ought to be in the container and all kinds of stuff are gone. This is the world's most complicated design. Okay. I'll show you the interfaces sometime. We, we're not going to go. I'm not, we're not going to spend much time with ActiveX controls, partly because it's quite complicated and partly because W, along came one of the big things about Windows Presentation Foundation. It says, this is a crummy model, throw it out the window. And now WPF draws everything. Draw, you know, yeah, I got a list box class, but what is it doing? It's just drawing, you know. Not, it's not activating, it's not loading a DLL, not loading a DLL that you know, is responsible for that. So. So we won't talk much about ActiveX control. That used to be a hot, hot, hot topic in COM. So what's COM, component, ob uh, so what's COM? Uh, component object model technology for reusing, uh, for composing programs from binary components without rebuilding them, support for driving components from scripts, support for building Windows programs with ActiveX controls, object linking and embedding, supports for building internet programs using ActiveX controls with Java or HTML containers, Lots of related services, component identification, location, persistence, structure, storage, monikers. Moniker is a slang term for name. It comes from some language, I don't know what. But um, when you make a shortcut on your desktop, you created a com object called a moniker. So, a bunch of technologies. A COM object looks like this. Every COM object looks like this. There is a server, the DLL. Not necessarily the server doesn't mean an EXE. It could be EXE, but uh, probably a DLL. And uh, there is a class inside that that supports a custom interface and the ion known interface. 
And the way it works really is this custom interface derives from I unknown. But I drew it separately because the client is really focusing on, it uses I unknown just to get its hands on that object and then it uses the custom interface to interact with it. And there's something called class factory that com uses to start this up. So your code provides a class factory but never calls it. When you call co-create instance, so there's a series of calls down through the common runtime that results in uh, using the iClass factory to create the instance that implements the interface. So here's this interface, and there's some class under that interface that's when you create an instance of it, it, implement, it implements all that functionality. That's what a class factory does. So every com object has a class factory that has I unknown and a an, uh, standard interface called I class factory, or there's all uh, uh, I class factory two. We'll see, you know, later on. Once you've published a interface, it's never supposed to change. Forbidden to change it. And you say, yeah, but along came clients of Com Technology, Microsoft clients, customers of Microsoft, who said, I want licensing. I want this creation to fail unless the user has a license from me to use it. They paid me money. So instead of changing the iClass factory to add that uh, subscription capability, it defined a new interface called iClass Factory 2. And now these guys have to support both. They have to support iClass Factory and they have to support iClass Factory 2. And uh, the, the clients that use the subscription service, they query for their code queries for iClass Factory 2. Everybody else queries for iClass Factory. Standard, standard com uh, design model. Question? Yeah, uh, this is a thing. I, I didn't get the last part. So you, you're creating a different class, but only that sole purpose. So, so this class factory is a class that creates the instances in this component. It's a, it's an object factory. You know, we've seen when I talked about widgets earlier. You know, there was a it was a widget interface in a, in a factory. Uh, this is the factory. This corresponds to the widget factory, and this corresponds to the, co the component that implements the widget interface. And every common component has both of those things. If it doesn't, it's not common. And uh, now we assemble programs. Normally, the client just talks to individual components, but sometimes one component, so this guy is a client of this component and a client of this component. Every once in a while, a component is a client of another component, and your project too has to be that. Either your, 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 uh, your file manager and the text searcher, you know, you're going to design it so one is a client of the other, and it can be done either way. It doesn't really matter which way you do. You either push or you pull. Uh, and this is a, for com, this is a little interesting because in order, this guy needs a pointer to get to this guy. And in general, we're not allowed to just hand him the pointer. If they're in different apartments, we're, that's absolutely forbidden because we'll break the threading models and the security models if we just hand them the pointer. So what happens is uh, you put in your interface to this guy, this guy provides in his interface uh, a uh, so this guy will pass this guy uh, one way to do it. This guy passes this guy an interface, a pointer to his interface, through the interface. And then this guy uses it to hook up. Um, it, uh, it sounds complicated. It is a little complicated. And we'll, we'll, I'll show you. you know, we'll do it. So. The service is always running. My Windows, whenever I set up a component, 
much exactly this is a constant. When you create a com component, there will be an object factory and there will be a component in it, period. Which on this dimension without creating so uh, the class factory only runs uh, com uses it, com turns it on, uses it, and turns it off. Okay. It's there, but the, uh, the instance in it uh, only lives for a short time. And that's under com's because the com runtime control. Server client or an application task. Yeah, so when, when a client says co create instance, the com runtime goes away and finds this class factory, and I'll show you how it finds it later on. Finds a class factory, creates a class factory, creates the object inside that knows how to create this object, and invokes it, and then he calls uh, release on the pointer and you got to the factory. So you're going to write in your DLL a method that gives the com runtime a pointer to your factory. And then, so com has a pointer to your factory, and then he uses that pointer to create the uh, fact to activate the factory the object, and then to invoke it to create the instance, okay. and that returns the, the com runtime a pointer to the to the active component that he passes back to the client. So co-create instance, all that's going to happen. We'll see how it happens. So this class factory will uh, release the component when we call the release, right? So, uh, so the class factory, the com runtime release calls release on. Okay. You don't com runtime. Does. Yeah, com runtime, like we we call com, com runtime and com runtime release. Yep. Co create instance is a com runtime function. And when the, all the instance will get released, the class factory will delete the component, or com runtime will do that. Uh, no, the class factory, all the class factory does is it has the one job of creating these instances. So when com calls release, that's simply, uh, that simply, Please account, I guess. Uh, that simply deletes the active component in here. That's all it does. It doesn't pull them out of memory because this is all in one DL. So it doesn't remove them from memory because if you did, then you'd remove the component you're trying to get to. Where we are storing that count of the components, like how many components are there in the DL? You'll there. see it. I'll, okay. I'll show you, but you know, that's going to happen probably next Tuesday. We're going to, I'm going to point to you and I'm going to say, over the weekend, go take a peek at this code. And then on Monday, I'm going to come up, or Tuesday, I'm going to come up with a big stack of stuff, okay? And I'm going to hand it to each of you and we're going to walk through it. And you're going to say, oh, this is painful. But we'll only do it once. So I'm a little lost over here. So this client is calling this component, and this component in turn is calling this component. So right? what happened is, call, this client goes to com and says, create me this instance, mm -hmm. and by calling co-create instance. Mm -hmm. And so the com runtime goes to the registry mm -hmm. and finds where that component is. And when he gets the component, then he calls, he, uh, he uh, creates an instance of the class factory, and you're going to tell him how to do that in your code. I'll show you how. He uh, creates an instance of that, and then he uses it to create that component. And then Tom calls release on this guy, and that just deactivates. So now that instance doesn't live in there. In there. The essence is like client wants access to this component, right? So what about this, this component? So, the, the, so there's so, you know, this class factory is concerned about this component, not concerned about him at all, he's concerned about this component. This class factory is concerned about this component. This linkage is something that you have to allow by the way you design the interfaces and you get it to pass pointers back. So, so this so we'll communication is about IPC? Is this communication, the cross communication from component to component? This component to component communication happens through interfaces. There's two ways it can happen, either by passing a interface pointer through an interface, that's the normal way, or there's something called, um, you pass it through a stream. There's a term they can use, and I've, I've forgotten the term. But uh, uh, what you're really doing is you are creating a pointer, and COM is setting up a proxy. When you pass it through a stream, that is really getting COM to create a proxy and a stub. 
proxy on one end, sub on the other end, to do that indirect communication. <coughs> and it's that indirect communication that makes different threading models work and different security models work. You don't have direct access to it. So, for example, uh, COM might intercept. You might make a call, and you don't have privileges to make that call on that function. COM will intercept it and never make the call in this channel. Okay, uh, so there's a bunch of technologies associated with COM. <coughs> Here's all the big parts. So down here is what we're going to be focusing on mostly. This is the core stuff that gets COM, the COM components to work. Now, uh, up here are COM controls, the most complicated. The, these are the ActiveX controls. And there's in-place activation that I talked about briefly. Uh, there's embedding and linking, and these are two different things. Embedding puts a fixed spreadsheet in your Word document, and it is just static, unless you delete it and embed another one. But linking uh, creates a, so uh, linking means that data is going to change and there's communication between Excel that's managing that change and your document. People didn't use linking much. The problem with linking is it sounds great. My documents are always going to be up to date. But what happens is, more often, uh, the other end got disconnected, okay, was deleted, or I moved this part, and I didn't realize I should conclude that part, and I put this over on this other machine, and it no longer works. So you have this document, valuable information, and you can never see it because that other part was lost. So people didn't tend to use linking a whole lot because of those problems. Just a management problem. There's ways of resolving it, but... So, but uh, linking and embedding, drag and drop, so that's calm. When you do drag and drop operations, it's really calm working underneath. Even when you do drag and drop on WPF, I am sure you've got a wrapper around calm because that's all. What happens with drag and drop is it's talking to the clipboard, which uses uniform data transfer to talk to the structured storage on the clipboard. So clipboard is a system-wide thing and I could put any kind of data I want almost on a clipboard. You know, you select this thing, control C. Select that totally different thing, control C. Select this wildly different thing, control, and it all works. And the reason it works is uh, because of uh, uniform drag and drop, uniform data transfer, and structured storage on the clipboard. So I, I can just put an overlay on top of my desktop. I want you to say this again. I can build an overlay on top of my desktop. Um, suppose I want to add a document, like this is a doc, document. You think um, I can? You could do what you're saying. You could do it other ways too. But you know, you could put a. What you're really doing is saying, I want this window. If these contents always to be on my desktop, you can do that. There are you know, typically what happens with uh, com is that you're using monikers, and the moniker may have a bitmap in it, image associated with it. Guess what? There's on your desktop this folder. Okay, there's a moniker. It's a com object that points to that folder. Or you might have to a web page you know, on your desktop. And what that moniker is smart enough to invoke Chrome or whatever your default browser is, and then give it that URL. So there's several different kinds of monikers, and but then they're all com objects. Um, persistence. So com has no way of persisting per se, the com technology. So this was invented, this is a com technology, and what this does is. <laughs> Uh, it uh, takes uh, 
uh, state information, there's a way to tell it what you want, and it puts it in structured storage. Now, a Word document is a really structured storage. Uh, structured storage is a file system in a file. And when you embed an Excel sheet in Word, the docx file has a place for Word stuff and a place for Excel stuff. And if you put a Visio, it makes another folder in that file for the Visio stuff. And so they can all work independently. They don't step on each other's toes. It, really, it works really well. So that's structured storage. And, uh, and we'll do a little tiny, uh, we won't do a lot with it, but we'll do a little tiny example. I'll show you a little example of that works. Uh, so from linking, there is naming and binding, that's monikers, desktop shortcuts and symbolic links and junctions and all those nice things from the windows, you know. So, uh, there is type information. This is the beginning of reflection. Instead of embedding it in the DLL, they made a separate DLL, which is a type library. And they concluded later on that was a mistake to have them separate, and they combined them together. When they built .NET, they put them together. In the assembly, they added the type information. What this is, actually, is a binary representation of your uh, idea. The binary representation of your interface, your idea. Uh, connectable objects. So I may want to be able to communicate back and forth. I want to maybe want to be able to do a callback. Callbacks are all done with connectable objects. And what they are, connect connectable object has a container, connection point container that has all series of connection connection points. And each connection point is a way to call back. And so what happens is when you uh, when you want to get a callback from some other object, you go to its connection container and you look for the event that you want to get notified by, and uh, you pass your a pointer to your object, your interface that's going to accept that notification uh, to the connection point, and the connection point uses your pointer to call you back. Uh, Property change notification. So uh, WPF uh, uses this in spades. That's you know binding. Uh, they're doing it, I'm sure, slightly differently. But the product uh, po property change notification is all about you know getting notified when some property has changed, so I can do something. One of the things that happens, for example, is uh, I may want my uh, a this box to share some color styling that I do on my window frame. And if I change the color style on my window frame, I want my list box to get a notification of that change of property and then it adjusts its own. Okay. Events. <laughs> These are the forerunners of delegates. Okay. And they work like delegates, sort of like delegates do. Okay. The problem is you look at the code and you say, what the heck is going on here? Okay. Because there's a lot of plumbing in it. Uh, did I do anything that made you do events? I think I didn't. I sometimes do on, on that comp project. But I will illustrate them. I will do a project that uses, uses them. So you'll see how they work. So in the midterm, in the midterm. That yeah, but that was delegates. So delegates are, so remember the .NET was the next version of COM. So uh, this turned into delegates. And property pages, so, so what, you know, with all of this, now up here at the peak is COM controls, and COM controls uses all of them. But uh, a lot of this, even if you're not building a control, you may need to use. So for example, uh, persistent objects. I may well want to persist my state. If I've got some COM object that's doing stuff, 
you know, I don't necessarily want to forget everything it did once it's gone away. You know, I could have the client save it, but this is a way to have the object save its own state. And um, monikers is a way of binding this persistent state to the construction of an object so it looks like you're using, it's the equivalent of using an argument for your constructor. Okay. But it's, it's just pulling stuff up out of the persistent. We're not going to, you know, if we looked at so that you knew how to program every one of these things, we would take the whole semester. There wouldn't be any presentation, no final project. We'd take the whole semester and do this. And back in the old days, that's what we used to do. And I didn't like it. The students didn't like it. <laughs> so I think this is a much better. You, you'll learn enough to understand the technology to be able to build a comp component and to recognize when you have problems that it could be a comp problem. And so you got some common sense about what's going on. That's what we're after here. Uh, what is DCOM? So, uh, so COM builds in a mechanism to communicate uh, across processes, and there's uh, several different. There's two different kinds of channels. This channel is very familiar to you, whether you recognize that from the diagram or not. In SMA, we had this server, and I kept telling you. The server uses a single threaded apartment model. Multiple clients <coughs> talking to a single object that's running on a its own one thread. And in our com case, that guy was just putting messages into a queue. Right? Remember that? I remember exactly like so uh, a single threaded apartment model is a model where uh, the com component there's a single thread that pulls messages out of a message queue, a Windows message queue. And multiple current clients can drop messages into that queue, just like any Windows window. Okay. And these are literally built with a hidden Windows window. So there's really a window here that has uh, a message queue. You get message, post message, get message, post, you know. And so what uh, what COM has done is, uh, with the when you build an interface that has some functions, I might have multiple clients calling those interface functions, and so uh, there is a Windows message which is just an integer, but in a certain range they're all custom. You know, any integers above this level are custom. They're they're, they're specific to me, my application. Uh, and what COM does is it uses that. Message and it associates the, the L param and W param. Okay. Uh, so that what happens here is when we get that message, uh, we're passing arguments through the L param and W param. The message uh, number says, which function am I going to call on that component? And the L param and W param provided the parameters to pass to that. And so what happens, I get this single thread that's calling, you know, making calls on this component, uh, and multiple concurrent clients are dropping messages in this queue, and it happens just fine. It looks like it's all concurrent, and I'm handling concurrent. Well, I'm not. Because I've embedded this. As soon as I embed this component in a single-threaded apartment, that means I've put this structure in place. And the client talks to it through a proxy. So. Uh, so, and it doesn't matter, you know, if this is in the same process as a lightweight pr uh, proxy, if it's between two processes on the same machine, I'm pretty sure it uses shared memory to communicate. If it's on two different machines, it uses the TCP stack. Pockets. There's another model, I don't I think I showed it in this, but we'll get to it. So, uh, technical significance of COM. Basically, the real issue is that its real significance comes from two things. One is, it really is an effective way of building big systems out of little parts that are manageable. 
That, that's what components promise to do, and COM does that in spades. Does it really well. And the second thing that is significant is that it pervades Windows, and so you better know a little bit about it if you're going to do technical programming on a Windows platform, because sooner or later you're going to bump into it. What's going on? What hit me? And you say, oh, oh yeah. So future come. Uh, so uh, I no longer entirely agree with what I wrote on that slide. So the future of calm, in my opinion, is uh, for the next 20 years, it ain't going to come out of Windows, for sure. I don't think uh, calm will disappear until there is some new operating system out of Microsoft, not called Windows. <laughs> Okay, and then it probably would disappear because it's old technology, and you know, and plumbing is hanging out, and it causes grief. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of nice, the ATL library is a good way of patching over. You know, that's that big ball of mud is is patched over all that plumbing hanging out, so that you don't have to deal with most of it. The library deals with most of that, of course. Uh, I'm not going to start this, so we're going to talk a little bit in this slide about interfaces, GUIDs, and stuff. Okay. And uh, so uh, we have five minutes left in the class. There's no point starting that. Um, are there any questions about projects or the final projects or the scheduling or the schedule may change a little bit. If uh, I think probably the people that are going to drop have dropped, and that will filter through to me. I, there's a couple of guys I know I signed drop forms for that still show up on my registration list. So as soon as they disappear, uh, I'll revise the schedule. That could mean that when you present, will change a little bit. I'll make sure you don't change, okay, because of your constraints. Um, and uh, also, you need to be prepared to present a little bit before your scheduled date because I don't know how long these are going to take. So some days will go quicker than other days, and so it may be you were scheduled for Thursday, but you're actually going to have to present on Tuesday because the preceding Thursday we did four presentations instead of three. Okay, so you want to be prepared a little bit ahead of time. Not in, a, not in a major way, you know. Uh, I owe you a description of what you were going to, you know, what I expect in these first presentation. There is a page for it. If you go to the final projects, you'll see technology presentation. There's a link there that takes you to a page that tells you basically what I'm expecting out of the technology. The main thing that may not come across real well from that web page is that I expect you to do a to, to tell us what your project's going to do, not just I'm going to do this main site and I'm going to use these technologies, but here's what my main site is going to do. Here are the things I want to accomplish, and this is my measure of my success if I do this and this and this. Oh, by the way, here's a, another thing I'd really love to do, but I probably won't get to, you know, that kind of, so you're laying that out. And if there's two guys, you're saying, Ronald's going to do these parts, I'm going to do these parts. Good. Line Any questions before we break? Is there anybody that doesn't see their presentation on the list? Yeah, and a people in my group. Can I add a person in my group? Um, if you're going to do that, do it right away, because that changes my schedule. Just join my Okay. Because I'm like... Yeah. What, what project are you doing? We have structured class. 
Uh, so why don't you send me an email and tell me who the partner is, okay. and I'll look a little bit at your project description. And what I, you know, I will let you do that, but I might say I want a little more scope to your project since it's going to be two people. I might not say that, but I might say I want a little more scope. And it's possible that your time that you present might change. But, you know, but you send me an email. Do it tonight, so I'll see it. No, do it tomorrow night, so I'll see it Saturday morning, because that's when I'll get a chance to do something. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, can you just show where the code is for the next Yeah. So the code that you want to look at is here. Uh, Improc example one. There's the code. Okay. Now, uh, hang on a minute. Let me look a little bit at, yeah, what we're going to do on Tuesday is we're going to be talking about these diagrams. I'm going to finish up this, the second half of this presentation we just were on, and then I'm going to show you these diagrams and we're going to interpret them a little bit. What do they mean? I'm going to show you how the COM runtime is interoperating, interacting with the COM component and interacting with the client. And then we're going to talk about this code. So probably uh, half the class may go to finishing this up and then talking about these diagrams. And then we'll begin looking at improc code. And then on Thursday, we'll finish looking at the improc code. What I expect. And, um, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of lines of code you'll say, what on the heck is going on here? I don't understand that. What's going on here? I don't explain that. But if you look at it and look at the structure, okay, here we're defining the component. Here we're defining the class factory. Here we're defining the client that's going to call that component. Looking at that. And the other thing is like, you can't, by the way, you can't run any code that builds a COM component without being running as administrator because you are making additions to the registry. You, you're not actually, but the code, there's a, uh, there's a package of registry manipulation stuff that was done a long, long time ago and everybody copies it because it's all that COM really needs. And, uh, but in order to run that code, you need to be. So you need to, need to, you know, I'm going to walk you through all that. So you don't need to worry too much about that. I'm just saying, if you try to run it, first of all, what's going to happen is if you try to run the code, it won't build for you. Building comp, uh, code is a little bit complicated. You've got to start with the MIDL, compile the MIDL, so that now you have the header file definitions. Now you can, you know, this, and I'm going to walk you through all that uh, interactively. So uh, probably for now, what you want to do is just look at the code and try to break it down into parts so you kind of know you you know you got the big picture. Here's Canada, here's the United States, here's Mexico, here's England over here, and way over there is India. Okay, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So, uh, the thing is, like, uh, do we have any sample presentation for the first presentation? Previous presentation? <laughs> no, there's lots of samples, lots of samples, but they're all coming later. You need to know a little more before the sample comes. You know, I did a sample 